Hello. Hi, can, you, can you hear me, Mr. Gandhi? Hi, this is Dr. Mahesh Gandhi. Hi, my, uh, good morning, Dr. Gandhi. Welcome to the panel. Yeah, hi. hi, how are you? Good, thanks. Uh, we're expecting two more participants. Uh, that is correct, yes. Um, yeah. uh, Eric and uh, Vinod. Mm -hmm. uh, you're uh, joining us from Germany, is, is that correct? Yeah I'm, uh, yeah, I'm based in Frankfurt, yes. Okay. I'm based in Frankfurt. Is, is, is the COVID situation a little better? Much better, I would say. <laughs> okay, I'm glad to hear that. Much, 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 much better. At least we can go around without masks and all. Okay, that's... that's Ex except, uh, except in the stores. Okay. There we have to be, of course, a little cautious and whatever, yeah. whatever. But otherwise, it's fine. Otherwise, it's... So you can Absolutely. indoor dining is open and all that for restaurants. Indoor dining is open. Yes. yes okay. Yes, yes. Well, that's uh, that's a relief. Yeah, things things are, things are much better now. Uh, we're fully vaccinated, most of us. Uh, significant significant vaccination drives. You know, Germ Germany is organized. I mean, it shows the U.S. has done a good job. It's just that the people are resisting so which makes uh, a bit challenging you know it's a much larger country 300 million 320 million people and we've got Excellent. about 75 percent adults vaccinated and so there is an increase in cases amongst the unvaccinated mm -hmm. uh, which is a bit of an issue it's causing a lot of headache for the government uh, sure. there's certain states that are you know anti-vax like florida and uh, Arkansas and so on, <clears throat> but uh, New York, what on the eastern seaboard is 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 pretty well under control, I think. So you know that resistance is there anywhere you go, even of course in in Germany. If you go to Berlin and the states around that, Bavaria, for the example, Bavaria was the worst hit. Was the worst hit. That's but, interesting. Uh, you have maximum, I would say, resistance to vaccination in Bavaria. And, and is that due to the religious considerations? Or? No, 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 no. There's no, no nothing, nothing to do with religion. It's just people. People don't want any vaccination. People don't want anything to go inside the body, which, which probably they're not even sure of what's happening. So there's a lot of uh, doubt, I would say. If vaccine skepticism, yeah. yeah. People, are, yeah. People are not, not really confident about the way. Of course, the government over here has been quite supportive. From all perspectives, I know in the U.S., uh, uh, the U.S. government gave checks of fifteen hundred dollars or something per person, maybe twice or whatever. No, that uh, was the, that was stimulus check uh, for the vaccination. There are other uh, incentives like there's a lottery program, there's uh, there's free beer, there's free pizza, <laughs> that kind of thing. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, but over here, what has been done is that at an average. 80% of salary of every person who was employed has been paid by the government. And uh, it is true, through and through. And this is going to continue until December 21 for a lot of people. And a lot of others, it's going to continue until December 22, especially wow. for, for Lufthansa employees. Uh, Lufthansa employees, they'll get it until December 22. And uh, a lot of other, other people, of course, even, even our company for that matter, uh, our employees uh, are eligible, of course, to whatever extent we request the government to pay. Uh, if we if we request the government that fine, we are not in a position to, you know, pay the salaries because the business is low. What is the reason? That's that's available. That's available. And it's being paid, and we don't have to go and request. We just have to put in every four months. We have to file some forms, and and that's it. Wow. No, oh, that's uh, that's you know a strong economy and a strong yeah. system. Yeah, yeah, and that's not limited. Also, not limited to people who are drawing a certain salary of let's say thousand euros a month or two thousand euros. Even even employees who are drawing like fifteen thousand euros a month were paid eight percent. Wow. 
So, so, so what the U.S. government has done, $1,500, maybe checks and, you know, trying to win an election over it. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's... No, but that's caused some other issues, you know, now uh, people are well, not... In Germany, in Germany, it sounds, you know, it's quite laughable because yeah. uh, we see it's quite funny what's being done. Yeah. I've, of course, uh-huh. spent a lot of time in India. Uh-huh. And uh, I have been on the infrastructure side primarily for the last 26 years and have worked on nearly all the sites. Uh-huh. I would say for the entrepreneurs, for the construction companies, for the developers and for the government and for the rating companies, for the lenders. But all as an advisor or as a all partner? As, all as an advisor. But of course, uh, now we are investors. We have been investors for the last or a decade or more ourselves. So you run a fund or uh, you we, do it? We run a fund in a family office, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And, and you invest only in Europe or uh, other? No, we, we, we invest primarily in the Indian subcontinent. Interesting. That's that's what we know best. So and, uh, most uh, of our investors yeah. And in the real, in the, at the project level or at the corporate level or in? Uh, Project level. I see. Interesting. Project level. And that's the reason why you know this this subject was very interesting for me. And uh, yeah, it I, might be that it'll be just you and I having a conversation. I don't know <laughs> if anybody else has someone joined. Has joined. Someone has joined. Uh, uh, no, I, I think we, we had, I saw Rajiv call join, but he is. Uh, he is I, I don't know. Let, let's see if I can ask him to say anything. <laughs> He's left. Uh, I, he appeared for a bit. I don't know if he's uh, gone I off, think. finding that the session has not started. Uh, Raju is a former IFC client, actually, uh, mm-hmm. from Calcutta. So while uh, so, Nico right? He's from, he's from yes, the Nico Group. Yes, yes, the Nico Group. That's great. He's yeah. the he's the chairman of the Nico Group. That's right. Yeah, of course, you know, that's uh, including Nico. I'm sure all, all, all these companies have seen, uh, you know, how uh, infrastructure PPPs were developed, how initially the industry was developed uh, using public debt, because that's what I was always thinking about. Uh, and then uh, you create savings in the hands of the people, you help them invest, you create PPPs. And then when we look at the uh, 2014, 15, 16, 17, uh, you mess it up and you're back to now investing again in uh, in infrastructure because you, you you were nearly on, you know, you, you were really already on a, on a, on a rolling status. Uh, it would have been automatic growth for the economy. You know, once, once, once we start investing in public debt, let's let's go back. Let's try to look at the Nehruvian economics. What was Nehruvian economics all about? It was all about investing in infrastructure, investing in industry. So government was raising loans, deficit financing all over. And and they were trying to uh, really, really put in what was necessary and what was required into infrastructure or industry. You created savings in the hands of people. You created entrepreneurs. You name them. You So many entrepreneurs were created. And then... You introduce VGF. The, the you remember that? Yeah, the, you know, viability gaps. Give yes, yes. The, the VGF, yeah. VGF format of uh, infrastructure development. You you introduce that, and slowly you come into the first negative grant project, which was the Delhi Gurgaon Expressway. I was involved in the VGF projects. I was involved in the first negative grant project. There were two projects, Delhi Gurgaon Expressway and Taj Expressway. We were advising both as bid advisors, and 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 interestingly, and which uh, group were advising? Pro- at that time, we were. It was. It was. It was a joint venture. It was a DS uh, JP, okay. JP DS. It was Jayaprakash Associates and DS Construction. Okay. They won both projects, Taj Expressway as well as uh, the Delhi Gurgaon Expressway. Both these projects were uh, negative grant projects. In fact, the first ever in the country. Right. You. That's what I'm saying. So that, that was the transition from from uh, government-driven projects to VGF to. Uh, negative grant and then absurd uh, bidding. Correct. 
absurd bidding. Now, people started creating order books. Of course, some of some of us were also responsible. We like, you know, stupid investment bankers. We're trying to help them create valuations. Oh, you can use this valuation to your advantage. But then we saw everybody, you know, most of the companies collapsed, whether it was Hindu projects in the south or unity in the west. Or I would not name all of them, but you know all. Everyone went to NCLT. Right. So you, you've seen that. And then now what we see in the last three years, four years, uh -huh. it's, it's, it's going back to the old times. Once again, you have EPC projects which are coming. Right. All, all yeah, yeah, because there's no sponsors left <laughs> with any money. No sponsors left. No sponsors left. So I think India is a great learning ground for people. Yes. No, no, it is. It is. At least telling everyone not what not to do. No, that is one, and uh, you know, there's one thing about the Indian, you know, subcontinent is there's no shortage of uh, brain power. So no. it's unfortunately negatively and productively used, but uh, yeah. the number of innovations that have been attempted, you know, it's most of them ending not so well, uh, but some more recently have at least shown some promise. You know, is is actually far advanced than many countries, including some of the Western countries. So you look at uh, at least the efforts, right? VGM was very early, but subsequently, you know, you had the IDFs, you have the specialized uh, infrastructure lenders, you had uh, now, you know, the Invits, uh, then you had uh, more recently the SFZ recycling programs in the form of, you know, TOTs, uh, and now more advanced asset recycling. And so there is a, you know, a continuum of innovation to, I would say, you know, figure out ways to finance and uh, figure out ways to address these these capital markets and, and local currency financing issues. And then, uh, you know, the issuance of masala bonds. So the reason uh, I say that is because, you know, I was the chief IO of IFC till two years ago uh, and uh, also involved, responsible for our infrastructure capital markets work uh, mm -hmm. globally. So I was involved in setting up... Uh, a number of these programs to fund local currency solutions uh, for infrastructure in a number of markets, and uh, it's it's very very difficult as you as you know uh, firsthand. Uh, but I did, was involved in the setting up of IDFC, in the setting up of IIF Indonesia, a similar infrastructure bank in Colombia, FDN, and then a green NBFC in India, which is actually probably the most successful of the lot, which is a joint venture with Tata's. It's called Tata Clean Tech Capital is the only green bank, I think, with any success in emerging markets. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, through this through this lens, you see at a macro level that, you know, the, uh, the there is no shortage of creativity and innovation in the Indian market. Just because the, the talent pool is so wide and deep, it's just Absolutely. that the mindset is very difficult, unfortunately. Absolutely. You know, the negativity of the mindset, and you see that kind of, in a similar way in Nigeria, I see that in a similar way in Philippines, where the creativity, the intelligence level, the talent is very high. But the collective mindset to actually do something right for that's sustainable over the long term, that's that's thoroughly missing. And that's that's fundamentally our problem. It's not that we don't know how to do this. We do. We just don't want to do it right. Uh, and then there is the, see, the point is, and the problem is not only one sided, you know, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about. There is a uh, problem on all sides. There's a problem on the political side. There's a problem on the bureaucratic side. There's a problem on the sponsor side. There's a problem on the user side. So, you know, it's, it's a very hard problem to solve and to, just by technical, I would say, solutions. It's in the end, it's a mindset problem in my view. Uh, so if you can get somehow a, you know, uh, starting with the top, I would say, I think the direction must come from the top, uh, you know, the right mindset to say, okay, you know, this is a bipartisan thing. This is something for the long-term good of the country. And we need to find a way to get this right for the long term. Uh, so otherwise, you know, you're going to keep going into cycles. Infrastructure is one. Well. Banking is the same story. It's exactly the same thing. Uh, you know, one disaster and after other, you try to privatize, but the sponsor also, you know, the same level of crookery you've seen in the infrastructure sector, you see there as well. 
So, so I think it's uh, it's it's a very big challenge. Let's put it that way. But, but I, I I would I would differ with you on that. Of course, you know, the Krukri is of course uh, infrastructure sector on the sponsors side. We have been sponsors. We have we have part participated with the sponsors. We have we have seen how uh, uh, it it was extremely difficult to 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 raise uh, debt number one locally. Uh, for projects which were which were good, which were good, which were really good, it was not so easy. It it was it was becoming difficult with time, and, and then uh, because the bidding was uh, funny, and then there was a lot of of course this is not the forum to discuss uh, what was happening on the political side, but but all but all said and done, uh, it was you know getting more and more more and more difficult to survive in that environment. Uh, and and unless and until you come up with creative solutions, you just couldn't do it. And then uh, coming to uh, now the masala bonds and securitizations and all that stuff, we have been attempting, of course, with some of the very interesting projects in the country, uh, including some metro lines. We have been attempting to to raise and securitize their future receivables and try to get them. Uh, you know, uh, it's it's you know airlines. Airline securitizations are happening, and did happen even in COVID times. There were there were two very beautiful deals uh, in Europe which were concluded, uh, where you could securitize airline tickets in, even in COVID times. But but metro metro is uh, something which is very interesting, where, where where we could actually you know securitize the next ten years, twelve years receivables, and come up with a beautiful bond. Uh, we attempted to do that, but again the currency. Uh, Problems and you know several other issues which came up, uh, performance matters, permissions from the government to do all that to replace the debt. Uh, it was not easy. Yeah, no, I ran securitization for IFC for many years, uh, actually globally, a long time ago, about I must say twenty years ago. So we did a number of deals. We still do. Uh, IFC has done over one hundred and fifty deals now. So yeah. I'm, I'm quite quite proud of that legacy. Let's put it that way. Uh, but we did the first few deals. I did the first synthetic deal in India as well for student loans years ago with City. Uh, but uh, the point on on the metro, you know, I've, I, I, we tried to do that for Thailand's metro, uh, yeah. you know, the uh, overhead metro you have in Bangkok. Because IFC was actually a big lender to that project and got restructured twice. See, the challenge with these things is that, uh, especially in securitization. Uh, is that you know the debt service is based upon a not non recourse structure right because so the only source of repayment is the cash flows of the project and for that the amortization structure of the bond has to be what we call in the business soft amortization right so basically at every debt service date essentially the amount of principal you get is really your share your fractional share according to the waterfall or whatever was received during that period which basically then means that you don't have an assured principle uh, for a given P and I schedule for for the life of the bond, and which then in turn means that you can't really get a swap uh, from uh, especially a soft currency to a hard currency. You can probably you can get a you know five year swap on a masala bond that you know we would invest in as I have seen, uh, so, you know, and uh, but you can't get a swap. For any soft amortization structure, because there is optionality that the counterparty would charge and they'll kicks the economics out of the room, you know, in in one second, so it becomes a non-starter. So that's the real challenge for uh, securitizing local currency receivables in a cross-border market. So the only way to do it is to do it domestically uh, at this time. And then there is really no, unless there is a, you know, a people are willing to take the currency risk in a. So you can do a euro, euro to US dollar uh, soft am um, swap, but getting a rupee to, uh, I would say, a dollar swap in a soft am structure is very difficult, unless somebody is willing to give a principal guarantee. Yes, so that's what I'm saying. The principal guarantees are something which uh, now I see that yes, uh, there are more and more and more insurance companies which are looking at India. Uh, we yes. have been discussing yes. meetings so. Yeah, so we, insurance we, companies are, I think, a very big untapped resource in my view. The reason for that is that, see, the, the benefit of the insurance companies is that 
they provide risk capacity as opposed to liquidity. True. And what what it does, because I'm an advisor to AXA in in France uh, on on these issues on, on the uh, you know the you know they have two businesses. They have of course the actuarial business, which is a normal business, and then they have uh, investing that billions of premium they get. So they they have their investment management business, uh, and they have a third business, which is the PRCB political risk and credit and bond underwriting, which is based here in Washington D.C. where I live. And in that business, they are looking at essentially participating in project finance on an unfunded basis. So basically, the liquidity is being provided by other sources. Could be banks, could be capital markets, but they take the risk. So they essentially wrap uh, the credit risk so that an institutional investor domestically, which has the local currency but no credit risk appetite, can come in and put their money and uh, against the balance sheet risk of the insurance company. So, but that. What we are doing—that's exactly what we are doing now. Yeah, so I think that's a lot of potential in that space, and it's an untapped potential. It's complicated. There are many, many issues, as you're no doubt discovering on the ground as you're looking at it. But in my view, that's a and it's a badly understood space. You know, there are a lot of people who think, "Oh, it's a guarantee, therefore should be priced cheaper than a loan." It's you know, it, it's exactly the same risk. You know, why should it be priced cheaper than a loan? <laughs> So, so things like that, you know. So, but there's a very widespread misunderstanding of guarantees uh, that, uh, you know, in my view, for some you know, investment bank like you, offers a lot of arbitrage opportunity and knowledge arbitrage opportunity to, you know, make make things happen. Uh, yeah, we, yeah, we we have been using, of course, private insurance companies, of course, are, are looking at this space now. You, of course, must have seen how. Uh, the ECAs have been supporting the project with a finance business uh, for the last so many years. I would say decades, uh, even in the in, even in the bad markets. Yeah, see, the ECAs are at a, you know are a different animal, as you know. So they have you know I have a very close relationship with Ulla Hermes in Germany. So you know I spent again uh, as a part of my role as CIO at IFC, I was also responsible for our relationship with the ECAs. Uh, so we would uh, it was a rocky relationship uh, unfortunately for uh, a very specific reason that uh, you know the IFC has uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this but we have a preferred creditor status uh, I still keep saying we because I'm still a senior advisor to IFC I could not escape them <laughs> after 28 years uh, and I joined them as a summer intern and uh, a long time 28 long time long time well you know I spent all I spent my, actually, I started in India. My, I must apologize. I forgot to introduce myself. So I started with the, the Reserve Bank of India as my first job, uh, starting from uh, undergrad in St. Stephen's. And then uh, my in uh, when I was a young executive assistant to Dr. Rangarajan, uh, that was my last assignment. Uh, I spent a year with him. And then uh, I came to the U.S. for a mid-career sabbatical. And then I did a small internship with the IFC, and they asked me to stay. And Dr. Rangarajan was very kind. He said, fine, you know, I think you have a better future globally. So he he, let, he released me from the RBI, and I joined IFC. And then uh, that was way back in 91. Uh, and uh, till 2019, I remained with the IFC. For the last 12 to 13 years, I was the chief investment officer and working all over the world, as you can imagine. In an organization like the IFC, but I was very lucky to work in India as well for mm -hmm. a good part of uh, you know my my career at different stages. You know, different in the mid nineties, the late nineties for a little bit, uh, and in patches. You you have seen the curve, of course. Yes, yes, yes. I was involved in a lot of interesting situations. You know, my first investment, believe it or not, was ILNFS. I was a summer intern those days, and you know IFC was a founding investor. But because we, uh, you know, uh, see, this is all uh, partly luck, partly due diligence, I would say. We structured a put option to Mr. Parthasarthi, which I exercised in 2002, uh, because the first, the day he invested in a project as a developer, uh, we exercised a put option. Uh, because our reason was very simple, that we signed up in an NBFC. We didn't sign up to have Never equity in a developer. Mm -hmm. And there's a straight conflict. And uh, so so we got out, and then we didn't lend him a penny. 
so in all this mess, IFC has zero exposure. Uh, and so I call this one of my best deals. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, although Ravi, I know very well, he's not doing well at all. Uh, you know, I used to find him. I mean, most people found him arrogant and irritating. You, you probably ran into him at some point. Uh, if you didn't, <laughs> good for you. <laughs> but but uh, anyhow, so all of us have been in those alleys. You know, all yeah. of us have been. In those alleys. Yeah. So anyhow, so so that's. But nevertheless, uh, yeah. coming back to the subject. In fact, uh, yeah. I, I know this is not being recorded, right? So this this panel is not being recorded. Uh, I, I'm not so sure, frankly. <laughs> there is supposed to be a recording button which you have to press. Uh, uh, no, but, but if you really want to record it, because I don't know, because uh, yeah, yeah, because uh, you know, I have a feeling that they are recording it. Uh, so, there is a recording button there, which you have to press because you were the you were the panel chair. No, so you, it does not say that here. It does uh, not. Usually. Maybe. Usually there is supposed to be a, a button, but uh, nevertheless. Nevertheless, oh, yeah, it's probably I don't know in the screen that I'm seeing, it's not there. Okay. But uh, anyway, please continue. <laughs> let's <laughs> assume right. it's being recorded. Let's put it that way. Let's let's assume whatever. So even even if it is not being recorded, it doesn't matter. Uh, I, I can be more open and more <laughs> more <laughs> comfortable. Uh, well, well, nevertheless, when we're coming back to the subject, when when we're looking at this curve, it's it's of course. You know, as I as I said, we start with the public debt. We get into savings created macro macro perspective, right. savings created in the hands of the people. We we get to uh, VGFs, we get to PPPs, and then we mess it up. We go back to public debt. Now uh, and then at this stage, the, uh, there are two two things that you have. One is public debt. Uh, the second thing that you the second uh, I would say weapon that you have with you is. You you can monetize those assets which were created Correct. using public debt earlier. Correct. So, Correct. There, that built up equity inside. Yeah. 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 So a you are trying to bring in more public debt for sure. Right. Second, you are at the same time also monetizing those old assets. Correct. So for example, uh, you know, simplest example would be National Highway Authority of India coming up with different kinds of bonds to monetize the road assets, et cetera, et cetera. Right. And so many, there's so many other projects. I, we don't have time to go into the details. But but what do you what do you what do you, how do you look at it henceforth? Do you, do you expect that uh, we will get more sponsors now uh, in the next near future? Or again, it's going to take like the same 20 years or 15 years for for the market to it's, it's a very, very, very good and topical point. So first on the monetization itself, you know, we have done only a few, so there is a lot more scope. Uh, but the challenge with the monetization is two, right? Because, you know, we have experience now in few countries, you know, Canada, Australia, Australia in particular, and the United States to some degree. To some degree in Europe, but not very much. Uh, so the lessons learned are the following. That one that... Uh, you know, the terms of the monetization firstly have to be uh, very carefully organized to ensure no public backlash. That they should be, otherwise it's going to, again, set the process back a long time. That the crown jewels should not have be sold uh, at the wrong price. That's number one. Number two, the issue in these things is also that it's a public service, more, uh, you know, roads or bridges or even airports. And so the quality of the operator is very fundamental. You know, it's no good to win a dispute in a tribunal, whatever, if the public service is disrupted. So so the idea is that even if you give a little bit of a better deal to the operator, the quality of the operator has to be absolutely impeccable. And the relationship and the ability to deal with the operator over a 20, 30 year period, you know, that capacity needs to be there, you know, in the government counterpart. Uh, as the, you know, in the end, the ultimate owner of the asset. That's the second point. The third lesson is that uh, the uh, sort of, uh, and, uh, is that the use of proceeds, you know, has to be very carefully managed because there is a big temptation, you know, when you are running a budget and you're constantly short of money, you have other political demands, you know, as sometimes as severe as paying civil service salaries. So, you know, to take this money and actually invest it in new projects, you know, requires a level of commitment and discipline and political will. You know, that has to be thought through in advance. Uh, so right now I'm involved in advising the government of Indonesia 
in some of these things. You know, they have had to, in fact, re-Christian this uh, whole program uh, because of this public perception instead of a asset recycling program into what they call the limited concession scheme, the LCS, uh, because that is simply a you know perception management issue that the government should not be accused of selling the crown jewels to the private sector uh, at at low price and you know with all kind of underhand dealings and all that so so but those were the three things now the question again is that and again as from the sector you know very well that uh, the problem in general in infrastructure is not the availability of care hi somebody's guest has joined us hi, eric welcome hi hi had some problems with the um, with run the world. Uh, okay. is not the first time. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not the most user friendly platform. I can I can mm-hmm. justify that. I'm now on my fourth or fifth meeting like this, so I have kind of figured it out. But uh, it's not. No, I, I, I have exactly. I've done this before, but uh, because I had a very bad experience the first time. So anyhow, yeah. all right. Uh, or, we, Hi, Eric. Hi. Right. So, uh, Eric, while uh, so we have uh, we have probably I don't know if we'll get uh, fourth participant or not, uh, but we still have a little bit of time. So maybe why don't you introduce yourself and then uh, we will let uh, Mahesh introduce uh, himself and I'll I'll I'll, I'll complete the round and then uh, we'll continue the conversation uh, around the topics that is interest to all of us. Okay. okay. Uh, Sorry. Gone. It's it's you're freezing up a little bit. Are you okay? It says I'm. I'm I, you probably cannot hear me because I you're freezing on my screen. Yeah, we we we. we yeah, okay. Yeah. Some network issue maybe at your. No, you yeah. have overcome the the entry problem, but now I don't know what to say. Um, um, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm. Am I still freezing? No, you're good now. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Okay, let's see what how this works. So I'm, I'm the chief economist of the AIB, uh, based in Beijing since October last year, and. Um, uh, I was previously this, had the same role at the European Bank for construction and development uh, some six, seven years ago for for about a decade, and in between there I've been um, a professor at the LSD. So that my I'm sort of recovering an academic, but uh, if you want, Great. thanks, uh, Mahesh. Thanks, Eric. Uh, uh, I am Dr. Mahesh Gandhi. I I have a background, of course. Uh, in teaching and other things, but nevertheless have been into infrastructure development, advisory investment now for over 25 years. Uh, so fit in the Indian subcontinent. So this subject and this forum is really interesting for me. Thanks, Mahesh. Uh, so uh, Eric, uh, I'm Arun uh, Sharma. I, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, I was with the IFC for a very long time and. Uh, I was a, a close colleague of uh, your friends uh, Martin and Wolfram, uh, and uh, did uh, quite a bit of work on infrastructure, including setting up IIF in Indonesia, uh, mm-hmm. and then its equivalent FDN in uh, in Colombia. Also set up uh, uh, IDFC uh, as part of that team, uh, and a couple of other. Uh, financial institutions and infrastructure, also ran securitization for the IFC for many years. So I've been involved uh, in uh, infrastructure for a long time, but also do a lot of climate work uh, with with the IFC. And now after leaving the IFC two years ago, I run a small uh, uh, set of assignments, uh, uh, which are uh, focused on helping really former clients. So I help uh, some large international banks like SMBC, uh, Standard Chartered, uh, Rabobank, uh, and a couple of other companies which are in the nature of AXA Insurance in France and then uh, MasterCard in the US. 
uh, on some of these uh, structuring issues, uh, a, a range of issues basically involving uh, different types of new business initiatives. So, so that's my background and delighted to welcome you here uh, on, on the panel. So, you know, what we were talking about before you joined Eric was, uh, you know, the, the challenge of how India has handled uh, the, uh, you know, its, its whole infrastructure evolution, let's put it this way. And, uh, you know, we have the privilege of having Mahesh, who has been involved at the project level, which is the best way to know about this, because that's where uh, the rubber hits the road and we know with what is buried and all of us uh, as lenders, I guess, in uh, EBRD or in uh, AIIB or the IFC also get involved uh, from a different perspective. And we have obviously also, and from your case, we also have a much uh, bigger, wider macro perspective as, you know, the chief economist of these institutions, as you see the evolution of these economies and the impact of infrastructure on the economies. So, the way we want, given the complexity of the subject and, you know, how uh, how many ways it can go, uh, we just try to narrow it down to, uh, you know, two key themes, uh, which uh, uh, in, I think the consensus is that these are the two fundamental themes. A, how do you bring bankable projects to the market more quickly? Uh, and then uh, how do you figure out how do you finance them uh, uh, without impinging too much on public finances, which are, you know, already under stress in most countries and will be under stress as resources are needed to battle other priorities like COVID recovery. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop here and maybe, you know, I'll ask uh, uh, on the first one on, you know, how do you bring uh, more bankable, financeable projects to uh, to the market? I'll start Mahesh to start saying, Given where we are in India and, and maybe in wider Asia, uh, you know, where, where do you see the constraint in uh, the uh, you know, credible pipeline, you know, coming to the market, and you know, what if anything, you know, can be done to uh, uh, to improve that situation? Let's put it that way. Mahesh, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Evan. Thank you. Uh, it's in fact uh, the question which I was asking you, you have put it back on me. So, so it's just before Eric, you came in, we were discussing the same subject. So mm -hmm. the idea is, uh, you know, I just, just, to, just to, of course, uh, rephrase the whole question, try to bring it in perspective. We were discussing earlier uh, that in any economy for that matter, uh, a new economy, uh, a government always has to start the process with raising public debt through deficit financing that's that's how an economy you know takes off a new economy as it matures you can get into ppps you can get into vgfs you can get into you know all kinds of uh, you know public and private entrepreneurs coming forward and beginning to invest in those projects uh, i'll not get to the third one because that's where we have had problems in India, but yes, that's very important for us to understand that uh, in India, what's really happened is in 2014 to let's let's speak about the period starting from 2010 on to the on to 2018, specifically these eight years, uh, uh, most of the good projects, most of the good PPPs uh, went bankrupt. The companies went bust because uh, they were probably not bidding right, the projects were not great, whatever was happening. Uh, the banks suddenly found that the projects were really not bankable. Question marks. Now, how to bring bankable projects back into circulation is, is extremely, extremely important, for which we need, number one, investor confidence. Uh, it, it, that's, that's critical. Investors need to become more confident of the processes they need to become more confident of uh, bidding at the right price. And of course, a zero corruption scenario, uh, which I don't know if it's going to happen but in India, but, but nevertheless, let's speak of any, any economy per se. Uh, a, a zero corruption scenario. B, uh, uh, investor confidence that yes, if I'm, if I'm investing into this project, uh, this project is not going to be canceled our policies are not going to change uh, within the next, within the, within the framework, within within the life cycle of the project, which is happening. In, in fact, in the past, we have experienced that. 
So A, we need investor confidence for the purpose that yes, uh, we can invest safely. Uh, we can bring these projects uh, into uh, you know maturity. They can they can be then be uh, you know capitalized later on so that they can be monetized. And and then of course the policies and framework around which we are investing today these will not change. So we need some sort of permanence. I think that's extremely important. Uh, everything else is of course numbers and uh, when a bidding happens i'm sure every investor every entrepreneur every ppp developer would make his calculations properly and make sure that yes he's putting in the correct number there which is which is going to be his bid price so from my perspective i believe uh, the political framework and the policies need to be really really stable that's something which has been missing over the last one and a half decades, but we expect that, yes, things will improve in future. Thanks, Mahesh. Eric, your thoughts? No, so I'm, I'm uh, very much on the same page. I think policy risk is the main risk, actually, in infrastructure finance. And um, it's not only in India, it's, it's, it's global. And, uh, you know, I think what, what really strikes me, and I, I remember coming to EBRD and looking at all the PPPs that EBRD had been involved in. Every single one had been renegotiated, at least one. And, you know, the record was not very strong in terms of uh, their performance. So there's a, I think there's a fundamental asymmetry between the international operator that comes in with a lot of experience, you know, a lot of um, international experience, a lot of uh, uh, skills and so on and you have often local community or, 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 or local authority or sometimes a, a central government that doesn't have the same experience but also has you know there are fundamental differences in in, in objectives often uh, b between the private sector and 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 the the, the government side and, and um, you know it's very hard to achieve the kind of commitment that you are you are asking for you know these are you know, in a democracy in particular, you know, how do you get this consistency when, you know, four years later or three years later, whatever, there's a new um, majority in, 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 they often would say, you know, this is, these debts are those of the previous government, the previous regimes or this project, you know, the failure of that is due to the previous government. So we need to look at this again and, and you know, bring in, and you get dragged into these um, international uh, uh, you know, over, international operators get dra dragged into this um, uh, uh, renegotiations, and, and you know, that, I don't think there are any very simple ways of doing this. I think I think there is a very important role for the multilateral development banks in trying to help mediate in these uh, situations and, and come in and work with the local government or the, the central government and on the. Uh, Make sure that there is proper preparation. That they fully know what what to expect from these um, projects in terms of uh, various risks, you know, from from the initial design to to construction to to uh, demand risk and so on. All those things need to be incorporated um, into the thinking of the local authority, and you need to prepare and also find ways of involving not only the current majority but also maybe uh, the opposition parties and so on into into the um, the, the project uh, process otherwise it's going to be very difficult to give them any sense of ownership uh, or responsibility uh, for the future so anyhow no thank you eric i think i would uh, uh, you know i've been saying this uh, for many many years this whole idea of bipartisanship i think i mentioned that in an earlier earlier chat with uh, <coughs> with Mahesh before you joined that uh, because all these projects, you know, are 15, 20, 25 years long and that they will go through many political iterations within, uh, you know, at the federal level or sometimes, you know, in the case of India at the state level, because that's the other thing that uh, even if the federal government is consistent, a lot of the day-to-day uh, -day authority and even sometimes the concession agreements are with the state government. And they can create a lot of trouble, and that's we are seeing that happen. You know, in Andhra Pradesh, for example, recent recent case where uh, uh, you know we have you know again we have a common client. You know, in uh, Tata Clean Tech, you know, our 
uh, the only project, you know, they've done 200 projects and I'm very proud to say that we have zero NPLs except one which has drag, been dragged into this Andhra Pradesh thing, which is, is exactly speaks to the point you just made, Eric, about uh, it's entirely political. It's nothing to do with the project. Uh, they just want to renegotiate the PPA uh, for, for just because it was done by the previous government. Uh, so, uh, you know, that I think is, uh, is a problem, as you said, it's not going to go away easily. Uh, it's, uh, you know, in, in China, you know, you have that advantage that you don't have to have that process that, uh, you know, the state leadership decides that, uh, yes, of course, there are complications within China also, we all know, but uh, at least you have the ability to, you know, make make a process work. And uh, so, but we, we have uh, clearly this lesson, I, and I think the multilaterals haven't really done enough in my view. Uh, you know, I can say that for the IFC, certainly that, in terms of asserting themselves, you know, of course, it's a delicate situation because you don't want to also start summonizing your client uh, too much. Mm. Uh, yeah. So, so it's uh, you know, and the other is that you know the setup we have in AIIB or IFC or others is that we are also then get conflicted very quickly when we start investing, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and so you can't be an investor and a mediator at the same time. So that's also not that easy. Uh, so. There have, but I think we certainly can make help create the awareness, and I think just a lot more. Uh, I think can be done in terms of creating this awareness. Uh, it's you know we do a lot of capacity building, a lot of seminars and all that, but the public awareness I think is still lacking. I have not yet seen one multilateral seminar that is addressing the public at large, where the multilateral speakers you know are on television, you know talking about the importance and saying these things bluntly that we are seeing here <clears throat> in this panel saying look guys if you want infrastructure you've got to essentially put this above the political squabble mm -hmm. uh, you know if you want the country to progress mm -hmm. uh, then and the public should be aware that look this is standard they need to hold the politicians to right mm -hmm. now nobody's you know experts like us you know people are involved uh, talk about this but the public has no clue about the damage that is being done to the country by this kind of behavior by, by politicians, uh, how it irritates the foreign investor, uh, how it makes difficult for the next set of projects to go forward. Uh, so I think that that's something that, you know, certainly could be a, a good takeaway. Uh, we're already out of time, but because we have the ability to uh, continue, I've just been told that uh, we can continue. Uh, yeah. Maybe I want to ask, uh, also your thoughts on the second question on the financing one uh, is, you know, given the fact that now uh, we have, uh, you know, the opportunity to, uh, uh, you know, basically try to revive, you can say, the infrastructure focus, hopefully with COVID easing and the need to s stimulate the economy given the, you know, job losses, the disruptions of COVID. Uh, you know, infrastructure certainly is, uh, you know, a key engine of growth and uh, so and also long term sustainable growth. So but, you know, getting getting financing for it is not has become more difficult because the public finance is now even more stretched with the stimulus, the COVID recovery and those immediate priorities. Mm -hmm. So in terms of, uh, you know, what options do we have? Uh, in, in getting, you know, uh, so private sector money back into the infrastructure projects. Uh, you know, any thoughts on that would be most welcome. So again, I'll start with you, Mayesh. Great. Thank you. Uh, of course, I would first go back to Eric and what he mentioned about the multilaterals. And of course, you, you reiterated that the role of multilaterals is extremely important, even in these times now and more so in these times. Uh, and as you were discussing before, before that, uh, even the large insurance companies. So it's it's not just the multilaterals. It's also the large insurance companies which can come and play a role. Uh, and both of them together, I'm sure, can also help in uh, neutralizing the impact of these political situations. Because and also maybe help help curtail that. So if uh, the multilaterals come together and the large insurance companies are there to help uh, cover some risk in one way or the other uh, you know it's it's all about uh, trying trying to trying to have some sort of a synthetic collateral to back it up 
But, but nevertheless, if the ECAs or the multilaterals or the large insurance companies are willing to come in and play a role, uh, I'm sure private investment uh, can 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 be invited again. I I, I don't see uh, that will be too much of a challenge, provided we have participation uh, also of the multilaterals and 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 large insurance companies. If that's coming, and we and to 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 get them on board, I'm sure it's very important that the government itself of any economy, especially India plays a very important, they have to play a very important, they have to invite these multilaterals, they have to invite these large insurance companies and they have to tell them and convince them using any kinds of conferences, seminars, webinars, uh, any kinds of uh, interministerial meetings, etc., etc., whatever they want to do. But they have to get, get to the multilaterals and to the insurance companies now and tell them that, yes, we promise you an environment which is going to be good, which is going to be stable, which is going to be like a rational environment for investment. So once these uh, uh, agencies are in, I, I don't see there's, there's uh, any shortage of capital anywhere, uh, whether it is the SPACs or whatever we have seen in, in the US in the last two, two and a half, three years, uh, we have seen how uh, capital can be raised. So there is enough liquidity uh, in Europe, in the US, in other parts of the world, and India is a great economy, and I believe uh, we will be able to channel private investment there uh, if we have assurances available from the government and then from the government to the agencies and from the agencies, then we can see a joint uh, kind of, uh, you know, a movement. That's my. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Eric, uh, your thoughts? Yes, yeah, so, so I think there are a number of things, points I would like to make. One is that, um, you know, we often talk about these huge uh, gaps in terms of finance and so on, and, and we forget that it's, we actually need a lot of different forms of finance, and yet adding it up um, is typically, you know, uh, not very helpful because, you know, we need some debt, we need, uh, you know, uh, uh, mezzanine finance, we now sometimes need equity, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of... of, of, of uh, uh, differentiation needed to, to understand the complexity of infrastructure finance. And then another thing that is sort of related to that is that, you know, we often bunch together private sector finance and institutional capital. And, and I think now, you know, what we are talking about when we, we talk about global liquidity and so on, it's mostly about, I would say, institutional capital. And yes, you mentioned insurance companies, uh, pension funds and, and, and uh, sovereign wealth funds and so on. These are very different types of of, of, um, of uh, investors, and they come with different types of capital. And and um, you know what we talked about earlier. Uh, so the private sector and the international operators, uh, foreign direct investors coming into infrastructure. That's a very specific, uh, uh, and, and they are usually you know quite used to the kind of risks that you ex are exposed to in in, in um, investing, particularly in the sort of emerging and developing world. So so. That is it's a different type of, of complexity, a different type of, of challenge than the one to get really institutional capital to come in. It's actually difficult, even in you know, the most advanced economies, to get institutional capital into infrastructure, because partly because there are also policy risks in those kind of uh, settings. So, so um, I, I can give you one example of a, uh, an investment that we have been involved in, or still involved in very much, is a because it is trying to deal with some of this. So, so the the issue is often that, you know, construction risk is a big deal for, for institutional investors. They typically cannot take that and they cannot justify that uh, to their well, boards and their, their stakeholders and so on. So, so what we did in, in, in Singapore, we're working with a, a private investment group, uh, Clifford Capital, and, and created a, a vehicle that would take out uh, sort of mature infrastructure assets, so infrastructure assets where the construction risk has, had been taken out and and then package them together, for, took, took them out from the banks, the commercial banks can handle that type of, of, of risk uh, that the institutional investors cannot handle. And we put them in this vehicle and then we can sell them on uh, uh, together in a sort of securitized way and, and we just had our 
first uh, closing on this uh, in uh, earlier uh, a couple of months ago and and I think that was as far as I know the first time that we got um, institutional investors into infrastructure assets in 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 the sense that we are talking about here in in Asia and and I I think we you know that is to me the model but what it took was we needed to take an equity stake in the this vehicle which is you know a big thing for a multilateral development bank to do we needed to vouch for the kind of ESG um, program of this um, of this group and this uh, this vehicle and very importantly behind all of this was a, a major guarantee from the Singapore government so you see that you know to really get this going you need a lot of different stakeholders to come together and and create it and and uh, this uh, Call the call the Bay, Bay, Bayfront infrastructure management. I think is an example of how you can take this forward. But but you know, in many settings, it's very difficult to 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 um, to get to bring all those things um, together to make it work. Thank you, Eric. Uh, I, on the last point, I would uh, firstly echo what you said. It's difficult because I tried my level best to get into the first deal with Clive uh, and promote on, on this deal. And I was yeah. kicked out by IFC. I could not do it because mm. <clears throat> too many policy constraints, uh, mm. you know. So I guess the lesson I learned there, and AIB got done it because this is one of the reasons I applaud the creation of AIB. I think as a multilateral, you are more focused. And I think you have a lot more wiggle room than somebody like the IFC because we mm. have so handcuffed ourselves to uh, our policies that these creative, you know, things where we need to push the envelope, they get lost in our ideology, let's put it that way. And I tried my very, uh, this was the first, This what you did was the second deal. Uh, mm. The first deal of two years ago uh, with, with Clive and uh, I was very close to doing it. In fact, I had done the first CLO of bonds <laughs> in 2001 with Credit Lyonnais, ex Japan, years and years ago. So, so I was very excited to say that, okay, we're going to do one again with mm. our friends in uh, Singapore. Uh, but anyway, so so that's one lesson that so it's great that AIB at least is able to step forward and you know take that incremental step that is needed to make things like this happen. Yeah. But the other two lessons I think of this very important development I would say are one that you need the intelligent application of sovereign health. You know mm-hmm. there have been lots of these VGF schemes and other sovereign health, but to leverage that in an intelligent way in a way that is financially sustainable, that has transparency, mm-hmm. and that makes sense, that optimizes the taxpayer money is very important. So I'll give you a live example. And if AIIB can help, it'll be fantastic. You know, India is struggling with creating a, an infrastructure guarantee company. And they've given the mandate to the government to do it. And, uh, you know, they just don't have the capacity. And I've told them multiple times, uh, that you know, you really need to involve the right s- set of stakeholders. If I, AIIB can go in and help them, you know, I think it's our friends in IIFCL, uh, you know, in, in, in India Infrastructure Finance, they are, they are you know, I think, being tasked with that. And there is a lot of, I would say, you know, politics swirling around it. I have no idea what it is uh, because IFC basically said, look, we can't touch it because it's state-owned and therefore we can only work with the private sector. But I think AIB has a lot more flexibility. So maybe this is something that you could look at because the thing is that, you know, like in Singapore, you created, you can say, an institution like Differ Capital, which can do multiple deals. They've mm-hmm. done this was the second one, and they can do 10 more uh, mm-hmm. with the, you know, the, uh, with the intelligent use of sovereign support. Because again, if you look at it, what the Singapore government has done in the first deal and your deal is not that much. Mm-hmm. They have just provided the delta between yeah. what it makes the com- transaction work commercially versus what it does not. And that is not much. It is a very efficient use of taxpayer money for a small amount of 